after a short uh, meeting of the monks after the sutra class, I pinned them down and said, so what do you want me to talk about? And uh, <coughs> because my imagination has been totally exhausted now. And so when I first started giving talks many years ago, I, I had it really easy because it was a Thursday night class because people kept saying, well, you need to give talks. And I went, oh, okay, fine. I don't have anything to say. And so I, I did what my teacher did, and he was very crafty. He had, a, he had a Tuesday night class that I went to for a while, and he would uh, ask people what they wanted him to talk about the next week. So somebody would go, oh, talk about bodhisattvas. So then the next week he would talk, and it would be, you know, a 30, 35 minute talk, and he'd talk about bodhisattvas. And we'd do an hour of meditation, and he'd say, okay, what do you want me to talk about next week? Oh, well, talk about karma. So if you, uh, we have a few books for sale. I don't know that we'll replace them once they get sold. I don't think anybody knows we have them. But he wrote a couple books in English and one of Zen philosophy, Zen, Zen practice. And it's very much like Shinru Suzuki's book in that a lady by the name of Katie Mann, who worked as his volunteer secretary, went in and transcribed his talks and then put that together in this book. And it's a really a wonderful introductory book for Zen because you don't get into any kind of, uh, you know, otherworldly stuff and everything. It's just a very practical book about practice. So I was asked today to talk about the place of women in Buddhism. Gee, and I have a room full of women, so that makes that a very loaded, loaded topic, doesn't it? And we'd already been talking, so I have to tell you that we've been doing the Lotus Sutra, and we've been doing it as we never have done it before at this temple. We're doing every single chapter of the Lotus Sutra. And before, we would kind of, oh, we'd, we'd go into the really, the, the, not, not so much important, but there was a lot of meat in it, and a lot of stuff was being said, and so we'd do that. And then we'd skip over these other things because uh, people would be like, we have a monk and he gets he gets fixated <coughs> on names. He goes, oh, and adjectives, oh. This thing just goes on and on with the names of Buddhas and adjectives. And so, and I know what he's talking about because we used to skip over those chapters because he would have so much of that stuff. But we, uh, we've done two chapters now that address women. And so uh, I didn't have a lot of time to think about, okay, what am I going to say about women? How am I going to start this, and how am I going to middle this, and how am I going to end this? So I'd like to start it by saying that many years ago when Watong um, Nyat Han first entered the consciousness, consciousness of the American public and practitioners, um, there was a book, and I really don't know whether it was in Zen Keys. I, I've read very little of his stuff, uh, because, <clears throat> just because. But And he's only written, actually written a couple of books. All the rest of them, or he gave talks, like I give talks here, and then somebody transcribed it, and they, here's another book. So he's got, he's got over 100 books out there, but almost all of them are his talks, which have been transcribed. But he wrote a book, which I recommend to you, called Zen Keys. And Tianan told me, my master told me about it, and he wrote that, he sat down and wrote it. And then Old Path, White Clouds, I always get that title reversed, I also recommend that to you. It's a wonderful retelling of the life of the Buddha. It's a big, thick Buddha book. I think we have one copy in the library, and I should probably try to get three or four more, because it's a wonderful book. You can give it to children to read, and they'll get, they'll get a lot out of it. Nothing, you know, it's not a, some, oh, I have to be enlightened to understand. It's just the story of the Buddha from the time he was born until the time he passed away. And uh, Watung Nyat Han wrote the book using only the Pali Sutras. In other words, the Theravada. So here's a Mahayana monk using only the Theravada Sutras to tell the story of the Buddha. Now, he did that on purpose, obviously, so that nobody would say he was biased because he was a Mahayana monk. So I do recommend those two books to anybody who watches this video and anybody sitting here. 
Well, in one of those books, something I read, he made the statement, and he made the statement, somebody asked him, um, you know, what is the purpose of, of the lay people? And he goes to explain that there, the Sangha is fourfold, and this is a common motif, is we have monks, and we have nuns, and we have laymen, and we have lay women. And, and uh, I've seen this repeatedly that he's made this statement that the function of the monks is to cultivate, and for those of you that's a foreign kind of concept, it's the idea that monks are supposed to follow the rules and do meditation every day and be mindful and uh, read sutras and do the things you would think that religious people would do. And the function of the laity is to support that practice. And then uh, there's the, the symbiosis that takes place is the monks will teach the Dharma, like I'm doing right now, and the lay people will make sure they don't starve to death. Okay, put very simply. And in the early days of Buddhism, if we look back, and when I get confused about statements, because i got to tell you, when I read that, he said the, the function of the monks is to you know practice, and the function of the lay people is to support them financially. And I thought, that sounds kind of self-serving, because I come out of this culture. And today, as we were talking about those sutras, which I'll come back to, I talked a lot about culture. Not everybody likes what I say about culture, but to me, it's the reality of things. We live within our culture, and other people live in other cultures, and we get really confused when we think other people are, are, are us, and they're supposed to live like we do, because we have the best way. <clears throat> Well, my culture is that uh, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant background that most of us have in America. Not everybody, but most of us have that. And that says that work is good and that people are supposed to work and they're supposed to support themselves and they're supposed to be independent. And so that uh, when someone says, well, you know, monks are supposed to be doing all this meditation stuff, and sutras and chanting and doing that, you know, religious stuff. And then the lay people are supposed to go out and work their fannies off so that they can support the monks. I kind of go, well, I don't know about that. That, that kind of some, something about that doesn't ring true. I'm not sure that I like that way of looking at things. And then I grew older and I, and I did more reading and I studied the teachings of the Buddha and, it, and I realized that uh, what he said was absolutely the way it's always been. But it's not the way necessarily other religions would do it because in the early days of Buddhism, the monks and the nuns every day after they got up and they washed their face and everything, they would take their bowl and they would go into the village and they would beg and they would be given the food that was a day old. People didn't cook meals for them. I'm, I'm sure somebody did, but generally they got yesterday's leftovers. And okay, so that was the function of the laity, is to give the leftovers to the monks. Okay, well, I, I can accept that much easier than the function of the laity is to, you know, support that just didn't that sound like buying a house and a big car. Remember that Indian teacher that was here a few decades ago that had a collection of Rolls Royces? And we had a hard time understanding why a, a real guru would have all these Rolls Royces. Well, that's where my mind went. And then we have things like the Deer Park, which was donated by a wealthy patron. And so if we really look at the life of the Buddha and his times, we find out that the property that was given to the Sangha so they had a place to practice was almost always given by somebody that had a lot of money. Uh, but the everyday people, and the Buddha had to tell everybody because he found out that his monks were going in and they were only going to the house of houses of the very well-to-do people. So they were going, you know, they were getting steak and potatoes. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, that's not fair. You need to give everybody a chance to support you. So you need to make sure that you don't just go to the house of the wealthy. And they may, you know, the, the monks were all like kids. I always think, you know, that uh, young monks are very much like children and that they went, yes, but 
will be a burden on the on the poor. That was your excuse, and the Buddha said, "That's nice." Okay, now that you've expressed that interesting opinion, I want you to go to the house of the poor. Well, what if they don't have food? I guess you won't eat that day. Okay, this is a really non. Even though he was very much willing to compromise on things, he said, "No, you give everybody a chance to support you." So that I finally figured that one out. Okay. One of the things that we ran into the Lotus Sutra is this whole notion of the place of women. Now, we get into trouble here because we think everybody in the world should be enlightened as we are, although we're not that enlightened. And I, I don't want to repeat everything I said during the Sutra class, which would be real easy to do. But just accept it for me. I'll talk to you afterwards and tell you where I'm coming from. We haven't always been nice to women in this country. And women always haven't had a voice, and things have changed, and I think it's wonderful they changed. I'm very much for that, but the reality is our culture in this country, for about 200 years, women were, they, they didn't have the same place they did in India, but it wasn't far behind it. Okay, so in the Buddhist time, women were, they, they weren't even like human beings. I mean, let's face it, in many, many societies today, a goat is worth more than a woman, right? So you have to realize, okay, those cultures, that's what they're doing. And that is their culture. And they don't even care whether you agree with them because that's the way they see the world and that's the way they act. That's not the way we act here, but that's the way they act there. So I said to everybody about, oh, it was a year, a year and a half ago. I'm trying to cobble this together as I'm talking because I've got some elements I want to bring in. I said to uh, to the group that was coming in Sunday morning for our little uh, sutra class, which is not always sutras. Sometimes our class centers around the topic and we spend a few weeks talking about that. Or it centers around that wonderful book that uh, Kaplow put out Three Pillars of Zen. We spent a lot of time on that. So it's not all, we call it sutra, but it isn't really always sutras. And I thought, okay, I want to see the fireworks. And I said, okay, the next topic we're going to talk about, come ready next week, is we're going to talk about American Buddhism. Does it exist? And if it does exist, what's it look like? Okay, well, That's a really interesting question, isn't it? Because if I talk to you about women's place in Buddhism, the first thing I have to ask you is, what country are you talking about? I know a little bit. If you want me to talk about the woman's place in Buddhism in China, I can tell you a lot about their place. Or Vietnam, I can tell you. Or Japan, I can tell you. Or America, I can tell you. But I'm not going to tell you the same story. Each place has a different story. I can tell you that no matter where we go, women are very important in Buddhism. But that doesn't mean they get the respect maybe they should get. But they're still very important to, the, to what happens within the Sangha. So I, I was all ready for a fight. Not, not my fight. I was all ready for people to start going, well, I think it's this and I think it's that. Because you know what, 40 years ago, that was a hot topic. 40 years ago, people sat around and said, we need to return to primitive Buddhism. And I said to myself, and that is, what's primitive Buddhism? What does that mean? <clears throat> it's like, you know, some of the kids, remember that, that period of time in the early 70s, when uh, there was a group of Christians that wanted to return to early Christianity. Do you, do you remember that time? It was, it was a movement within California. I don't know if it happened anyplace else. But they stopped going to church. And I ran across some of these people. They, they actually started doing their religious services in somebody's home. And they stopped going to church because they felt organ, organized religion was bad, that the way they were doing things was bad, and they needed to get back to primitive Christianity. And their definition of primitive Christianity 
and they were all born again. It was right around the time the born again movement started. And, and they were usually young, bright eyed, good looking kids. And they would get together and read the Bible and talk about what Jesus said and what he really meant and all that kind of stuff. And at the time I thought, well, it's, it's, it, it's interesting and it's certainly not a bad thing that's happening, but it's not primitive Christianity. Because primitive Christianity it, it <laughs> took place in the, the Egyptian desert in caves with people that we would call kind of nuts and they were hermits and they lived in there for years and years and years and some of them went crazy and there weren't any in women involved right, by the way my this is just this is my opinion i think women are very practical most of the time so women probably said you're going to what you're going to go live in a cave and you're going to eat bugs i don't think so i think i'll stay in the city here and have a nice rice dish or something so our idea, and uh, I don't really know what anybody's idea of primitive Buddhism was, but I can tell you primitive Buddhism would probably be when women were second-class citizens, and I don't think any of them realized that, okay? What they really meant was, and they said it later on, we ought to practice Buddhism that is not in 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 encumbered by culture. Okay. Well, that makes a lot more sense than primitive Buddhism because, you know, from what we can tell on primitive Buddhism, nobody would really want to do that anyway. And how do you do that? In Nebraska, how do you sleep under a tree every night when you got six feet of snow, you know? Really? Come on. So, but when you say, let's see if we can remove some of these cultural things and get to the heart of the teaching. Well, the heart of the teaching of the Buddha is expressed very succinctly in the Lotus Sutra. In the, in the chapter under uh, Devadatta, he tells a little story, and the Buddha was a great storyteller. He tells a little story about someone going down to the kingdom of the king of the ocean. And there was a princess down there, and she was eight years old, and she was enlightened. And he talks about this little princess. Well, what's the big deal? It's a girl. Not only is it a girl, she's eight years old. And when we read that this time, I, could only, I, I couldn't help but thinking of Dokken admonishing his students and telling them in the Shobo Genzo, when they <coughs> ask him, who do you study with? Who do you pick for your teacher? Who will be your master? And he says, if you can find an eight-year-old girl who's enlightened, you should study with her. And it finally clicked where he got that from, mm -hmm. was out of the Lotus Sutra. So all of a sudden, this, we've elevated this notion. The Buddha was known to predict the enlightenment of many of his women disciples, particularly the lay women disciples that supported him. The little girl that fed him his first meal when he was dying Sujata stayed his, his disciple all her life and passed away and they came and said, what's going to happen to Sujata in her next life? And he said, she will be enlightened. She only has one more birth and she's done with the wheel of life. So the Buddha's opinion of women were, there's no difference. But culturally he was stuck because Devadatta, who was his cousin, was a real bad character. And he said, if you let women become monks and nuns, you will destroy the Sangha, <clears throat> and I won't stand for it, and I will take all of my followers and we'll start another Sangha and we'll destroy what you're doing because women are filthy and just put all, you know, the adjectives, just put all the adjectives in there you want to, how bad women are. And the Buddha made a compromise. He made compromises all the time. He said, what will, you, what will it take for you to let women become monks? And so we have things, and they're really not that big a deal, but basically the men always have to be in charge when there's a gathering of both. In reality, what happens in the Orient is the women have their temples and the men have their temples, and people go to both temples. It's not like no men go to the women's temples. Lots of men go to the women's temples and they're recognized as being great teachers and some of them are enlightened. 
that's what's happened there but we're stuck with those old rules so I thought American Buddhism for a while it was a hot topic so I said what do you think <laughs> is there such a thing and if there is such a thing what does it look like and Sandy said well what we do here and I said what do you mean what we do here and she said well what you've taught us that's American Buddhism and she completely killed that day <laughs> because there was nothing more to say because when Sandy speaks everybody listens and she just went to the very heart of it and certainly that's a way of looking at it so a few years later Donna comes to work on the sculptures and Donna starts almost yelling at me because she's found out there's some things she doesn't agree with with the way that other countries do Buddhism and she's saying she doesn't like this and she doesn't like that, you know. And how come monks can't marry? And why is this going on? And why is that and everything? And uh, I said, well, I, I don't know what I said. But I remember her almost yelling at me, well, this is American Buddhism. And I said, how, what do you mean it's American? Well, we're Americans and we're practicing Buddhism, therefore it's American Buddhism. Which is a kind of logic. I, I like it better if you say this is what Americans are doing right now rather than calling it American Buddhism but Donna is a woman of great passion and she wasn't going to let me get away with that she said this is American Buddhism I went oh, okay fine <laughs> okay so if, if we start with the premise that lay people their function we're going to go back to Tai Nyan Han their function is to support the monks and nuns if we can go from that, now we're going we're gonna to look at one a favorite of many people, which was Shunru Suzuki. And he gave a series of talks out in the, out in the county, uh, away from the, the, the center, at a lady's house, who I, I read many years later became a nun, but I think he was already passed away when she did. And she recorded all the talks, and then they got together, a bunch of them, and they transcribed the talks, and we have our wonderful books in Mind Beginner's Mind. And in that book, he made a statement. Now, I had a monk friend who misunderstood what Shinru Suzuki had said, because we always have to have things in context. We've got to be careful that we're not reading stuff into stuff. And he said to the group out there, they were all lay people, he was the only monk there. And he said to them, you're not really lay people in the traditional sense. I put the traditional in. He said, you're not really lay people, but you're not monks either. And then just add traditional. And Americans, I'm sure those people at that time understood, but my friend who was a monk and he was learning to be a monk, he interpreted that as he wasn't really a monk. And he interpreted it as he wasn't really a monk because he wasn't Japanese. And he just brought all this baggage in with it. And he started telling me this, and he gave a talk. And he used that as the, as, as the point in his talk. And afterwards I said, where in the world did you come up with that idea? And he said, well, you know, in Zen Mind's beginner mind. And I said, well, tell me what he said. And I said, he wasn't talking to monks. He was talking, what was his audience? See, when you read the teachings of the Buddha, you always have to know who his audience is. Because the Buddha did not always talk the same. When he talked to people that had lots of money and lived in fancy houses, he talked one way. He talked to their condition, as Nagachita would say. He spoke to their condition. When he talked to the very poor, he talked to them from where they were at. And you, you don't want to get confused to think that he, good teachers don't talk to all their students the same. That's what we do in education, right, Mary? Everybody, okay, this is the way the reality is. Now everybody memorize this so you can, you can check the right mark on the test. But in reality, nothing's like that. So why did he make that statement? He made that statement because in America, people do monk stuff. In Japan, no lay people do meditation. If they have a little, they have clubs. They have little meditation clubs. And they feel really good if they can get a monk to come in once a month and supervise their little meditation club. Zazenkai. A little club. Have tea afterwards and say, oh, we're doing great. 
Okay, but the average person in Japan doesn't meditate. A little secret for you, the average monk doesn't either after they're done with their training. They go back to the temple and they do funerals and they do memorials and they celebrate the holidays, but most of them are not meditating. So when Shunaru Suzuki said, you are special, you're not really lay people, but you're not monks. Well, you're not monks because you didn't shave your head. You didn't dedicate your life to teaching the Buddha Dharma. But then you're not really lay people in the sense of Japanese lay people because here you are sitting on this cushion every week at this lady's house and sometimes you come to the San Francisco Zen Center for our celebrations. So you're very different. Every teacher that I've met that came from the Orient has had basically the same song to sing. Americans will take Buddhism back to the Orient. Okay, my Japanese teacher said someday you'll go back to Japan and you'll teach them what the practice is. Tianan said the same thing. Someday you'll go to Vietnam and you'll teach them what the heart of the practice is. Because they've lost their way. They've gotten confused. And they both really agreed with the people that said we have too much of this stuff is cultural stuff. Okay? The food we eat. I, I, I always have to smile when people come to retreats here and our cook cooks for them and in the winter time we all, almost always have one dinner of lasagna. Right? Mm -hmm. Guys? Yeah. yeah. Because there is no such thing as Zen cooking. Okay? There's Zen malnutrition in some monasteries but there's no Zen cooking. It's Hopefully it's all good cooking that was done with love like Ed Brown and his cookbooks, you know. But there is no there is no right thing and everybody doesn't have to eat rice Everybody doesn't have to eat noodles. There is no Zen cooking. There's just good cooking prepared with a good heart. And that's getting away from the whole cultural thing. It's like most people now are not wearing kimonos under the ropes. When I was young, I had, two, I had a winter and a summer kimono that I wore under my ropes. I tell you the truth, they're really, really comfortable to sit in. You get your legs up and everything, they don't get in your way. But they're, they're not very practical for traveling around town because you look like you're in a movie or something. You know, people go, oh, where are you coming from? Are they doing Shogun 2 and you're, you're in the cast? So there, there are adaptations. In this country, as far as I can tell, because the question was women's place in Buddhism. So let me tell you where I think their place is in America. <clears throat> and if you're really curious, I'll tell you where their place is later on in other places. But in America, their place is exactly identical to where men are. There is no hierarchy in this country because of gender. I have not seen it with Americans. The primary form of Buddhism that exists in this country and Unless somebody proves me wrong, and please write me a letter if you know something I don't know, is the Soto Zen form of uh, Buddhism out of Japan. And, and the Soto Zen form of Buddhism out of Japan, of course there's men and there's women in that form, and they both can marry. And I have friends, one's, a, a, you know, I call everybody a monk. Monk to me means trained. You're in training. None means something Catholic. So I, I you, you, all of you that are around me, you know that I always just say monk, because that means someone is working on themselves. Okay? And somebody who stopped working on themselves, they're deluded. In my mind, that's who they are. They, they got confused. They thought they were all dumb. But these two friends of mine, they're roughly the same age, and they're roughly my age, and I, was, I took pictures at their wedding ceremony. And they got married in their monk's robes. And she wore a wedding dress underneath her monk's Aww. robes. Yeah, it was pretty cool. But you can do that in soda shoe. Now, she, they had to have special permission to do that, okay, because that was so different. But in Rinzai, which is not the predominant form of Zen in this country, women don't marry by their choice. I've been told by Rinzai nuns that they don't because they, they just don't. And I have conjectured that they don't because that way they don't have to follow the Japanese tradition of the women doing what the men say. 
if you don't have a husband, you don't have to worry about him telling you how to live your life. You can go out and be a great Zen master. So I think the predominant form we have here is Soto. And everything that I've seen, men and women stand at, on an equal level. The distinction is not made one's greater than the other. And we were talking today uh, about this in the sutra class, and I didn't. I was going to say something, and everybody, it, it, it was a hot and long conversation. But we had the abbess of uh, ZCLA, which is one of the older Zen centers in this country. She came up here one time. I invited her, and it was for that monk over there, Bui Mung's ordination, when he became a novice, and uh, we we invited her because they knew each other real well. And she came up and then we're going to do our little procession. First of all, she sat right next to me at the table, as did her right-hand woman, nun. And the monks are going, they're, they're not, the Vietnamese monks aren't too sure about this. And then we, we did our little procession where we make a little parade. And one of the monks uh, went to tell her that she needed to go into the back. And she said, no. I said, no, I'm, I'm a Roshi. I, this is where I walk, and she walked right behind me, okay? That, if there is, I don't think there's such a thing as, Amer I, I disagree with Donna. I think there's Americans practicing Buddhism, but I don't think there's something we call American version. But this is different than any place else in the world, that our women <laughs> are exactly on the same level as the men. And the Buddha is not rolling over in his grave. He is smiling. Mm -hmm. Because that's what he intended all along. And that's the way he taught. He never taught that there was any difference between men and women. You know, there's a, there's a lot of historical confusion. The poor Tibetans think that it's a terrible thing to be born a woman. And that a woman has to go through many, many successive lives. So she can be lucky. This is the Hindus too. Be lucky enough to be born as a man. And all of that nonsense. So... That's the place of women in American Buddhism is the same place as men. They lead, they're strong, they have their own personal message. Most of them are involved in slightly different things than the men. They're much better managers of temples. I know this for a fact, but the women are much better managers of temples all across the world. If you And I tell the Vietnamese this, and at first they would go, but I tell the nuns that, they go, oh yeah, if you want to build a temple in this country, which nowadays costs millions of dollars, right? If you want to build a temple, give it to nuns, and within 10 years, the temple will be built, usually in five. If you want to give it to the monks, it'll take them 30 years, okay? <laughs> and why do I say something as silly as that? Because I've watched it happen. A lot of the real beautiful temples where they got rid of the houses that were there and they put in the traditional temples with all the architecture. Okay, <clears throat> I've watched nuns, four or five years, it's up. You go talk to the abbots, they go, yes, well, maybe maybe in 10 years we'll, we'll finish this up. So that is the place of women in Buddhism, if we're talking about monks. If we're talking about the lay people who support well, how many women do we have here and how many men do we have? And what's the ratio? I don't know. What is it? We have two men, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's about four to one. Rob. Huh? Count Rob. Did I count wrong? Did you count Rob? No, but I like it better when it's four to one. <laughs> <laughs> So, I, I got lots of people I didn't count. But that's the way it's in the Orient, too. If we didn't have women in the temples, the temples wouldn't even, they couldn't function, really. If we need, if we need a new roof, you get the women to do the fundraiser. You know, if, if we need to have a child care program at the temple, you turn it over to the women, they get it done. The men sit around and argue about it. You know, how are we going to do this? So women just get in there and get it done. So, and of course, that's just my opinion on that one. But it is very much my opinion that uh, 
if the first part of American Buddhism, there's two things that you can say are American Buddhism. Lay people have a practice. They meditate, they, they study, they do things that are not done in the Orient, primarily the meditation. Meditation is looked at as a monk's practice that lay people just don't have the time to do. And the other thing is, uh, the other thing is what? Well, that, well, the lay, the lay people, I don't know. <laughs> I got lost. I was doing really good. I stayed right on track. That they're equal on equal footing? Yeah, they're on equal footing. Yes, that's definitely American Buddhism. That the lay people do the meditation and the practice, <clears throat> and that the monks and nuns are on equal footing. And as far as I can tell, they always have been. Almost from the beginning. There were a few of those Japanese guys that tried to get away with it. The American women didn't let them do that. Yeah, they said, no, this is not going to happen. So, thank you, ladies. Mm -hmm.